Donald Trump wants to have high quality American manufacturing. So where, if you where, wait, can I ask you a question? No, where no, no, does no, he, no, no, wait, 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 no, 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 just a question, 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 question. No, 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 I gotta ask, I gotta ask, I gotta, I gotta clarify. I gotta ask, where does Trump make his ties? Where does Trump make his ties? Where does Trump make his suits? Where does Trump make his everything? Oh, he makes them in China. He makes them in China. It's kind of funny, right? How have you been? I've been pretty busy. So I know you've been pretty busy as well. Uh, but apart from that, I've been okay. So yeah, I like debates. I know we're going to have a debate here and I'm trying to get back into streaming and everything. So yeah, it's good to be here. What have you been busy with, Kevin? Uh, work for the most part, uh, organizing memes and stuff, getting ready to be like the ultimate reply guy over on X. I've got like several thousand memes to organize into different folders and stuff. Oh, wait, wait, so when sorry, I'm, wait. Uh, you have several thousand memes? Well, yeah, I mean, I've made a couple thousand, but I've got a lot more that I've, uh, you know, been uh, meme thievery, uh, you know, the old meme thief memes. So uh, you've probably seen like declaration of memes over on X. Uh, he's given me some good advice with regards to that, how to be like a better reply guy, that sort of thing. Cause it's kind of a pain. I'm like on my phone, I see something I want to respond to, but I've got so many memes that it takes sometimes so long to scroll to try to find it that I don't wind up getting the reply in that crucial uh, second window to get big impressions from. So once I got them all in folders, I'll be more active on X. So. Gotcha, so so right now you're you're aiming to be a, one of the top tier reply guys on X. So when, let's yeah. say, one of the bigger accounts like Biden or Trump post something, like you wanna be one of those first people to get like, first three minutes you got like a meme in the reply so you can get one of the top likes, That's that's your goal? Well, with regards to X posting, yeah, I'm also going to be doing video content over there. Uh, Twitch recently changed up their uh, uh, their monetization policy, meaning that I can technically stream to multiple platforms at the yep. same time. Great. I just have never done that apart from using Stream uh, StreamYard, but StreamYard is uh, Boomer Energy. So I'm going to be doing it through like OBS. So I got to figure that out and everything. But I will be doing regular streams again. And I'm going to try to be, you know, once X videos becomes like a big thing over there, I want to be like Elon's, you know, super soldier over there on X videos. So You're excited to use X videos? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we're going to make a lot of money on X videos, posting, you know, politics on X videos and stuff. So be yeah, fun. yeah, I have a lot of experience <laughs> with X videos. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people do. So, yeah. so I, uh, you're a you're a what now? I'm a what? You're, a, what, you're a anarch. What? No, no. You're like a Bidenist, Trumpist. What do you want now exactly? Can you? Yeah. Can, yeah because so I, I don't wanna... like. I don't know how to interpret this. This stuff I hear, or what I'm being told yeah. that you believe, and that's why I brought you on. So can you just tell me what you believe about what should be done 2024? Uh, sure, sure. I just want to start off by asking you. I guess the question you mentioned that you've been told stuff about me. What have you been told about what I believe? Is that that, that you're this. basically a you're a Trumpist Bidenist that you want Biden and Trump to kind of unite the country by teaming up together going into 2024. Yeah, so I, I like to use like MAGA Bidenism more than like uh, oh, Biden Trumpism oh, that's, that, or whatever. That's, that's even better. Uh, let me let me change the title. MAGA Bidenism. Okay, gotcha. Well, well, it's because like I prefer Biden, right? I think Biden's a better representation of the idea of uh, national greatness than Trump. But I think Trump largely got that ball rolling in terms of the economic discourse. And I'm not the only one saying this. I think it was the guy who started like what the Unite the Right or something. He came out and bit, did like a big article saying like, look, if you're MAGA, you should support uh, Joe Biden, basically, in 2024. So uh, a lot of more sort of economically uh, populist type figures have recognized that Trump had pretty decent rhetoric, but he didn't really follow through on a lot of uh, his economic agenda. He did some things, but Biden's done a lot more. I mean, for example, Donald Trump said, what, what do you want to do? He wanted to bring, bring the factories back, right? I mean, he did some tariffs with regards to steel. He talked a lot about that, but at the end of the day, he didn't do that much. And then you got Biden coming out here who's actually uh, invigorating uh, semiconductor battery manufacturing and other key industries that have so far been dependent on foreign countries for. So if you're a more economically protectionist minded person, Biden's more your guy. Uh, he better encapsulates the, uh, the sort of uh, MAGA idea than Donald Trump even. But, uh, you know, I do it as like somewhat of a meme. 
the whole uh-huh. they should run together. Uh, but I'm I'm dead serious. I think Donald Trump would make a better vice president than Kamala Harris, though. I think Kamala Harris has got to go. So, so, so can you give me so the serious down. the serious way of interpreting this is Biden president, Trump vice president. Uh, that'd be more of the serious. The meme version is you have like this gigabase diumvirate co-presidency of the two as the joint paramount leaders of America forging the new century together. That That's more like the meme version. But in reality, Joe Biden's more of a leader. So uh, Donald Trump's more of like a, a charismatic spokesperson. But, Donald, but Joe Biden's more of like a get things done kind of guy. So... so. My problem, I mean, there's a lot of problems I have with this, not only because there's a lot of things that they both believe and that both of their parties stand for that are incompatible, but I also just don't believe that these people would be able to work together. I believe they despise each other, uh, that their bases despise each other, and that Donald Trump uh, fundamentally does not uh, appreciate American democracy in the way that uh, other politicians do. And I think he only sees it as a tool to help himself when it can't help himself and a burden when it is, you know, a barrier between him and power, as he showed in 2020. And the idea of putting that man anywhere close to the presidency again feels like a dereliction of duty to protect the Constitution, which he said he wanted to suspend. So I don't understand how somebody could at least appreciate Biden when it comes to an institutional level that the fact that he at least respects the democratic process, but then also say, let's put this this ticking time bomb right next to him to see if possibly the oldest president's croaks and then we replace him with the guy who doesn't particularly appreciate American democracy. Just seems not only that these two people would be unable to work together and that their ideas are incompatible, but that it's just pointlessly dangerous. Well, I'm aware, just uh, right off the bat, I am aware that they don't really like each other too much. Uh, when I do the whole mega Bidenism thing, I'm more talking about the spirit of their economic agenda rather than them as like, you know, buddies. I mean, sure, I've got the memes of like them bowling together and like, you know, uh, in the winter together, smiling with a snowman. And mm-hmm. there's um, I, I, I've made some of my own AI memes of them uh, giving speeches and, and, and putting in policy together and stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, so is the uh, vice president thing also a joke or was that serious? No, well, well, that's okay. That um, let, let's just be clear. There are other people that he could select to be vice president. I think a more realistic option would be somebody like Gavin Newsom. But I'm dead serious that Kamala Harris is like dead weight. I think she's she's a, a net liability on his campaign. I, I think that he would be better. Now, granted, he should have done this a long time ago. But I wouldn't think wouldn't Trump be a liability him. for the country? Um, wait, how, how so relative to the other people in his party? Like, again, because we're talking about Republicans. I've already made it clear. I, I well, think I Biden mean, is preferable, but if we're I talking mean, about like compared to other Republicans, best. like, you be wait, okay, so you think Donald Trump is the best of the Republican options? Uh, of the ones that have a shot at president. I'm sure you could find me some, like, mayor who's a Republican who has some really good ideas that I could get down with that's like in Iowa or something. Trump but as far as the guys that actually have a shot at it, the people that have been in the, the actual debates, the official the presidential debates on the, uh, or, or the primary debates for presidential nominee on the uh, Republican side, uh, he's by far the best. I mean, we're, we're talking about, and I'm dead serious when I say this, he's actually the most progressive Republican ever elected president you can name me i don't know let's say uh it was his supreme Ronald court Reagan. Ronald Reagan appointments was that led to the overturning of roe versus wade oh oh for sure for sure and he's that also makes the him most the most pro- progressive yeah he's also, well, it's not like uh reagan or bush or any of these other guys wouldn't have wanted to do the same the difference is that uh donald trump doesn't have this ideological fealty to that uh agenda i think the only reason why he's even a republican is because the Democrats didn't really want to hang out with him anymore. I mean, he's had a lot of uh, isn't uh, that scarier to, to me? That's scarier because to me that means like that he's like a political chameleon, and therefore, if he's given the opportunity, he'll take whatever position allows him to garner power, or influence, or favoritism. Well, in the American system, that would mean uh, taking the position that the people support because the U.S. system is a democracy, right? So, I, uh, wait, not necessarily. I mean, number one, just because it's something that's popular or populist, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing to do. 
um he like somebody can like rile up a crowd to be in favor of something that takes away our civil liberties and civil rights in a crisis right whether or not something's popular does not necessarily mean the person should implement it there were periods of time where horrible horrible things were abs were overwhelmingly popular there were certain decisions sure, no. that we engaged in that were popular but not the right decision so I don't really think the popularity necessarily, like in some instances that can lead to good things, but in other instances that could lead to just like rabid populism and terrible decision making. Not to mention the fact that he's also willing to take unpopular decisions. The overturning of Roe versus Wade and the appointment of the judges over, that overturned Roe versus Wade was not popular with the American public. And it led to the Republicans getting hit at the ballot box in 2022. And I don't think that if he was genuinely to overturn the results of the 2020 election, that would have been particularly popular. But if he could have done it, would he have done it? Yeah, so with regards to the Roe v. Wade thing, I support abortion rights. Like I said, I prefer uh, Biden. Biden is a more, on the whole, a more progressive person than Biden on almost every policy. Biden the is more progressive than Biden. Than Donald Trump. Yes. Um but the difference is if we're just restricting ourselves to the right side of the spectrum in the US system, and we're looking at the Republican Party, uh, if we're comparing Donald Trump to Ron DeSantis, for example, Donald Trump is a more socially progressive and economically progressive person than uh, Ron DeSantis. If we're comparing him to uh, Mike Pence, for example, the same can be said as well. If we're comparing him to really any of these sort of power players in the Republican side, he's a stark break from the traditional corporate uh, conservative agenda of the Republican like, Party. There's he's I far mean, it's, more it's, pro labor, it's, it's, far no, more pro. No, uh, oh my God, what? Then, then you, Ron DeSantis. Then Ron DeSantis. Ron do you DeSantis remember the Donald Trump labor, NLRB John. board? I mean, I I, no, Ron, I worked with SCIU 1199 during the Trump admin. I was interning with them, trying to learn about union organizing, and the NLRB under Donald Trump was absolutely god awful. Its job was to literally do nothing to help working class people. What was the policies that Donald Trump took that ended up helping working class people substantially? Yeah, uh, so he imposed tariffs on uh, steel imports, for example, that benefited steel workers in the okay. United States. That's and what example. about the manufacturers uh, he, that he, relied on the cheap steel and aluminum because it was also aluminum imports? Yeah, yeah, so if your business model relies on getting cheap stuff from uh, foreign countries, oftentimes countries that engage in pretty sketchy behavior, uh, and that's the only way that you can make a profit, yeah, I mean, you shouldn't be in business if you can't do it ethically. Okay, so, so wait, 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 my question was, what did he do to help work? Workers, and you talked about the tariffs, but the tariffs helped workers in one industry while hurting workers in other industries, and it didn't lead to any like net job gain or net economic benefit for the United States. It benefited workers in one particular industry at the expense of other workers. Well, that's not, but that's not exactly true because we're talking about industries such as steel manufacturing. That's a, a pivotal one for national security. That putting profits aside and putting jobs aside, it makes sense to have the Yeah, you can subsidize your own steel industry, but why do we have to put tariffs on foreign steel? Well, it's again, it's the sort of thing that you want to encourage uh, that to be done within your own country. Again, again yeah, time... you can subsidize your domestic steel and then not put tariffs on foreign steel. And so then the manufacturers that rely on steel don't take a hit and your domestic steel market has benefited from the subsidies. Yeah, but I, I do think it's fundamentally a problem that you allow things to get to the point where a lot of the uh, operators in your economy are dependent on foreign countries for their inputs, especially in the case of a war, especially when those countries tend to be hostile to your own, or they tend to be countries that are easily occupied uh, relative to, to yours. And so in that sense, it makes sense to have something like steel. Uh, steel is a big one. I would argue semiconductors are a huge one None too. Of, but wait, wait, wait. Um, this is no longer a question about U.S. workers. Now this is the national no, security but, issue. Well, yes, but it, it's both. It's both, right? Because some workers are fundamentally involved in uh, aspects of the economy that are more critical to national security than others. Okay. I think it's a bad. If, if, no, wait, wait, Dylan, wait, wait, Dylan, wait. Dylan, 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 Dylan. I think it's a bad thing that the United States economy has been rotted to the point of being primarily a service economy, and I think Donald Trump and Joe Biden have both recognized that and their rhetoric. 
rhetoric, which for the record should be noted, Donald Trump started, addressed that as a problem. Donald Trump this was started a stark, it. Yeah, well, no, this was a stark break in the tradition of his party to support that neoliberal outsourcing agenda. Uh, he really kind of got the conversation moving in a more economically nationalist direction. Joe Biden's ran with that and done a better job of it uh, than Donald Trump. Okay, had. so but to be clear, the steel yeah, tariffs it, didn't help any American workers outside of workers in the steel industry and hurt other workers. But we're going to talk about this from a national security perspective. We can have that discussion. And I agree that having domestic steel manufacturing is important for national security uh, discussion and for us tightening up our logistics when it comes to crucial industries. Let's say there's a okay. crisis for whatever reason and we couldn't import the steel. We need to have some amount of domestic steel manufacturing. But yeah. that doesn't mean I'm against importing foreign steel. And I say that as somebody whose family had to leave Ohio due to the importation of Chinese steel. The economy in the United States has changed since my grandfather worked in the Ohio steel mills. It has changed substantially, and I yeah, don't and it's see. Not necessarily changed for the better, Dylan. I well, mean, no, you, let me, you didn't sounds... let. Well, yeah, you got to talk. Let me finish. Okay. I want to subsidize and help American steel prosper, but adding those tariffs, while it will help the American steel manufacturers to some degree, because people will be forced to buy from them, a lot of businesses will not be able to compete. They'll go under. Their people will lose jobs, and not only will those people lose jobs, but the businesses that stay out there, stay working, they'll have to increase their prices for whatever products they're making, whatever it's, whether it's construction, whether it's, if we're talking about aluminums, we're talking about people who do canned goods, stuff like that, and then that price is passed down to the consumer. That's not even to talk about the fact that right now we're trying to fight inflation like a motherfucker, and the last thing we right now is a, is a price increase for these types of goods for the American consumer. So I, I think... You can chew gum and walk at the same time. You could subsidize your own steel industry and still benefit from the international steel market. I don't see the necessity in placing that restriction if we can subsidize it anyway, especially if we're talking about a worker perspective. Yeah, so I, I would say that fundamentally you're engaging in this with accepting as a status quo the globalized economy. And I would yes. argue that, especially on something such as steel, uh, being self-reliant is more important than, uh, oh, maybe some people in another aspect of I'm, the economy lose their job, but they could be doing something more productive. In, okay, for but example, that's fine. Say, you can say that, steel, right? but then you have to drop the thing that this was good for workers because it's we've just talked about how it hurt workers, how it hurt consumers, not, not even talk about any possible inflationary impact. I don't know how well, we're talking about this. Like, we can talk about it from a national security perspective. No. We can but it didn't help but workers. Dylan, Dylan, there's going to be growing pains in transitioning. Okay, from but then how does it help workers even in the long run? Then? Because we're talking about in the long run, being a self-reliant economy would fundamentally be better from the standpoint of labor within the U.S. and Canada. Uh, but we can limit this to just talk about the U.S. Then it would be to continue down the road of perpetual outsourcing to the point of becoming an entirely uh, service-oriented uh debt economy essentially so in that transitional phase there will would it be, be better for yeah. I, like i can understand trying to promote your own like giving initial startup capital to stuff like they put the chips act i agree with that but if i started saying okay. stuff like no we're not gonna buy taiwanese chips we need to have, make all the chips in the united states now would that help the american chips industry absolutely the american chips yeah. industry would see skyrocketing investment overnight but it would also lead to probably 200, 300, 400, 500 percent price increases for laptops, uh, cell phones, all sorts of goods. The military would also have that same problem. And so in my my position would be accept the Taiwanese ships while we build domestic chip manufacturing, which from my previous conversation with you on the issue of Taiwan was your position as well. So I don't understand yeah. why that same logic wouldn't also apply to steel. Okay, well, yeah, I, we can run this through. So you talked about the price increases, for example. Let's understand if we if we set, for example, the goal, uh, which I'm kind of proposing, is to be basically self-reliant on steel and chip manufacturing, uh, that doesn't mean it happens overnight. The question is, do we keep importing until we get there? I'm not opposed to importing until we get there. What I'm opposed to, I guess, is but this that, idea. But that's not what Trump, no, what Trump, not, wait, no, what we're no, talking no, about no, Trump's but, steel tariffs. Trump's okay. steel tariffs was pl put in place while we still needed the steel. In the American steel industry, the growing pains you were talking about, we hadn't yeah. even started feeling those. The, yeah, the, the, the uh, seed had not been planted. 
Yeah, but I'm not I'm not saying that his policy is perfect, but I'm saying it was better than what we were doing before, which was basically just let everything go abroad. And to go in the other direction, even if you go too far in the other direction, is still better in consequence than to continue down the course can, you were going. Can you which give me of, any... Which is a course of ultimate dependence to the point that any shock in the world system, whether it be a war or a natural crisis, could entirely disrupt your economy. And, in, and especially in an area like steel or, or chips, uh, it could actually hinder your ability to wage war. That's why I discount the, the price increases, because at the end of the day, you're better off paying higher prices for things. We would never apply this logic itself. anywhere else. Like if I'm in Ukraine and I'm like, hey, we need to buy, like, for example, the Czechs right now are trying to argue with the French and the Greeks and the Cyphrans, uh, what do you call Cyprus? I don't know what you call it. They're Cyprus, but what do you call their people? Cypriots? Cypriots. Okay, Cypriots. Yeah. Sorry. I, I've never really had to talk yeah, about no, Cyprus that much. One of my friends much. actually lives in northern Cyprus here. I think they follow so me on Twitter. They have like the little, uh, do they have the little helmet icon? Yeah, War yeah. Kettle. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, War Kettle's there. He's up in TRNC, so yeah. But um, they're trying to debate not buying foreign shells outside of the EU to send to Ukraine. Well, Ukraine wants those foreign shells. The Czechs say will facilitate the purchase of 800,000 shells. They said they could get it to yeah. their country in a week. That would be amazing. I mean, if we could enter those shells into Ukraine, I mean, the 500,000 shells from South Korea, that had an impact. But the French, right. the Greeks, and the Cyprus don't want to do it because they want all of the money to be put placed inside the European defense manufacturing sector. And the $4 right. billion dollars that could be used to buy those foreign shells could instead be invested in, say, the French shell manufacturing industry or Rheinmetall, right. one of the German defense, something yeah. like that. Now, I understand that logic, but number one, the French said that if they didn't hit the 1 million number, then they would allow the foreign cells, you know, when they said they were going to hit a million shells by March and they yeah. didn't. So they kind of yeah. lied a little bit, and that is the French being the French. Well, that's politics, though. But, but... but let, me, let me just quickly say, from a Ukrainian perspective, right? Right. They need the shells now. And from their perspective, it's why not buy the shells as well as invest in it domestically, since this is something we need. If American consumers need steel, if American manufacturers, construction companies, uh, can, uh, can good manufacturers, whatever, need these products now, then why wouldn't we continue to allow these imports to allow the prices to stay lower while building up our own industry to be more competitive like we've done with chips? I thought the Chimps and Science Act was brilliant and that was a Biden okay. initiative. Yeah, well, because uh, the chips is kind of an exception. Generally, what happens with these things is if you just accept the globalized status quo, uh, you don't have that pressure to invest on your own side to bolster production. And so if you say, OK, we don't have that option anymore, then you have no choice but to invigorate that at breakneck speed to get that up and running. So if you can do both, OK, but usually what happens is you just do the lazy route, which is continued dependency, and then nothing ever gets done on the domestic level. I mean, you've seen this in many industries in the U.S. where, uh, in Canada, where it just gets sent abroad. Of course, and nothing, but this nothing is the thing that scares me. To... Let's say we fail. It's not impossible that we try to build up our own manufacturing sector and, and we fail, right? Like, it's America can succeed, but what, if we fail and then we have all the tariffs in place, what does that mean for construction companies? What does that mean yeah. for can manufacturers who now don't have enough domestic production because we weren't able to expand it quick enough and yeah. also have massive tariffs placed upon well, foreign imports? See, that this is one of the problems with the U.S. system, though, which is that tariffs are a good way to uh, galvanize support for bolstering domestic production. But you know what's better than that for bolstering national production? is to have the United States government uh, produce steel. That way, if you have a quota set in place, you'll get there, as opposed to relying on private actors to just do the right thing, which oftentimes doesn't happen. And so uh, there's a Chairman case with- Chairman uh, Kevin, I didn't there's know. There's a, a case with essential uh, uh, production like chips, uh, steel, steel's a big one, auto, et cetera, that, uh, that if the private market's not gonna step up and get it done, okay, well, there's another way to do that. You set a plan in place, you have a quota, and you make it happen if the if the private market's not going to do it. So where would we get the money for such an effort like that? Well, I mean, the United States has a lot of money. Where would the U.S. get the money to send over to Ukraine? 
right? If there's a well, I would say right? like so. starting a industry from scratch. If we're not seizing companies, which I don't know if you would be in favor of seizing companies to do this, or if you would want to start a public competitor who competes with the private steel companies. Um, can we move off of this topic? I feel like because I don't know okay. Trump, he, because I don't think Trump's proposing a public steel company. I don't know. Yeah, if no, any, well, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, I'm not I, I understand. I understand. I'm I just, not agreeing with everything that Trump said on steel. Yeah, I'm just saying it's better we, than better I, than what Reagan. I think was we doing, disagree so. on the steel stuff. Let's move on because I don't know how much people want to hear us debate steel uh, tariff prices all day. Okay. As, okay. Do you okay. have any <laughs> concern when it comes to the? Just general anti, I was talking about this earlier. This is the thing that, of course, concerns me most about Trump. He's just general just disdain for democracy. It seems that he doesn't really respect the process all that much. And if we made somebody like that vice president or president or really, I mean, you can make him head of the local post office. I'd be afraid of him abusing his position of power to either hold on to it or exploit it, etc. Yeah, so... Uh, Donald Trump, it, it, it's oftentimes taken out of context, the extent to which he's branded as like anti-democracy or whatever. I mean, again, he had something like 73 million people vote for him or whatever. It's not like this guy has like no supporters and just comes in with the military and shuts down the elections or something. It's like, no, there, he has a broad base of support. Um, and now, uh, with respect to the question of, well, oh, you know, is he might he abuse his position of power for personal gain? Uh, I'll say this, he wouldn't be the first president to do so. I, I think I think he should probably have an investigation into Bill Clinton's relationship with Jeffrey Epstein, for example. Um, and, and, that, and that guy got two terms. So, you know, Donald Trump only had one term. Uh, the difference is jo uh, Bill Clinton sent all, all your jobs abroad so you could have like dollar stores and stuff and have like cheap plastic goods that break in two days. Donald Trump wants to have high quality American manufacturing. So where, where, wait, wait, can I ask you a question? Where does he, no, wait, 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 no, 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 just a question, question, no, no, I gotta ask, I gotta ask, I gotta ask, I gotta clarify, I gotta ask, where does Trump make his ties? Where does if Trump make his ties? Where does Trump make his suits? Where does Trump make yeah. his everything? Oh, he when makes I just... them in China. He makes oh, them okay. in China. It's just... kind of funny, right? That's yeah. why I say All Biden's right. a better champion of actual economic nationalism than Trump. Trump's got pretty good rhetoric. Trump's also kind of a hypocrite. He's kind of a goofster. He's kind of a jokester. He's kind of funny. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of humor in that. I, I think it's so, kind of funny that the hats and stuff are made in China, personally. So, you know... Um, <laughs> like, you know... <laughs> for me... I think Trump genuinely just doesn't give a, give a fuck about democracy. I mean, back since 2015, anytime he'd lose, he'd blame something else outside of just the fact that he lost. Whether back in the primary, he'd say, well, no, there was this one team that was doing this phone banking tactic that stole votes, or mm -hmm. they did this one thing with Ben Carson, or this thing there, yeah. or they stole it from me. And then when the 2016 race came around, he refused to say he would accept the results. And then when he won, that wasn't enough. He also still claimed, no, actually, it was stolen from me. Still, it's just that millions of illegal, still not substantiated, by the way, years later, millions of illegals had also stolen the popular vote from me. Then, four years in office, comes around 2022. He says straight up, if I lose, this is in advance of the race, if I lose, it's rigged. He's saying that in advance, if I lose yeah. the election, the election is rigged. How do you go <laughs> into a race with two candidates? One could win, maybe the other wins, who knows? And one of them are saying from the outset, I will not accept the results if it doesn't go the way I want. The democracy doesn't work in a two-party system if one of the major parties doesn't accept the results of the election. And when the results came around and he lost, he didn't accept the results of the election like everybody could have told told you what he would have done from just seeing his statements beforehand. He calls the Secretary of State of Georgia and tells him to find the votes to make him win, gives him the exact yeah. number of votes he's down. The exact number of votes he's down. He doesn't say, <laughs> hey, I heard that some votes aren't being counted. Count them all. He says 13,321. Oh, that right, just so right. happens to be the exact amount he's down. He <laughs> is trying to intimidate him to give him the votes. He even said that if you don't do the right thing here, consequences will come. And when election season came around again, what did Trump do? Supported his primary opponent, tried to punish him for not stealing the election for him. That's not even talking about writing up the executive voters to seize voting machines with the military. That's not talking about the false elector plot. That's not talking about how he delayed after the protesters on January 6th stormed the 
the Capitol and were bashing down the windows, how he sat in his room locked for three hours as people, his children, everyone was begging him to do something. But his response was, oh, wow, you really pissed those people off, huh? While Rudy Giuliani was still calling Mike Johnson, the rest of them, trying to get them to send it back to the states where the Republicans had the majority. He was trying to get Mike Johnson to do something completely unconstitutional that not, not Mike Johnson, uh, Mike Pence. Mike Pence told him he didn't have the authority to do it, but he kept pushing for it. This seems like after losing all the court cases, he tried to go around the system every certain way he could, all the way down to the buzzer. And now he's coming back around again, still not accepting the results of the election, headed to 2024. If he loses, will he accept the results? No, he won't. And then we'll be in the mess again, but thankfully at least he won't be controlling the institutions. If we let that man near the institutions, man, how could we at all trust him to so, treat those institutions responsibly? So Dylan, I got a question for you, uh, because you're using here, your like uh, referent group or your referent, uh, referent uh, interest here is the idea of constitutional democracy in the United States. Yes, right? and you are uh, Canadian, and, yeah. so I don't know and how so, much that matters. Well, no, 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 I, I wanna talk with respect to that referent uh, interest that you, you're phrasing this around. So yes. what do you think would be more harmful to that? Uh, banning a guy that 70 million people or more want to vote for to be president or letting him run and say, oh, well, maybe it's rigged if I lose or something. What do you think is more harmful to democracy? Banning the guy it that depends, wants, It or... depends on what he's done. It depends on whether or not he's eligible based on his own behavior, whether or not he's popular, whether or not he, he like a lot of people clap for him at his rallies or millions of people think he's a cool guy, shouldn't be the only determinant factor on whether or not somebody can run for president. If somebody intends to destroy the system or tried to destroy the system, tried to take advantage of the system, tried to cheat the system, then we ban them. If somebody in some NASCAR race is known to be like a crooked cheater who like slashes everybody else's tires and does everything they can to circumvent right. the system, even if they're fucking Dale Earnhardt, they could be the most popular NASCAR driver in the world, they might get suspended from participating in the system if they can't play fairly. And while, of course, this is a lot higher stakes than some NASCAR race, at yeah. the end of the day, if Donald Trump is trying to circumvent the system illegally, and he is trying to steal the election, and that is what a court decides, how could we possibly allow a man like that to run? Now, personally, I would like to see Donald Trump get defeated in an election. But I also know okay. that institutionally, institutionally, if he is found in a court of law to not be eligible to run, he should not be allowed to run because we so, need to defend the institution. So it raises a couple of questions. There are kind of two directions I want to go in this. And I'll just make this right now just so that we kind of know where I want to go with regards to that. The first point is uh, if you do, do go in that direction, a court whether partisan or not rules that he's not eligible to run. I don't want to sound like Tim Pool here, but that would kind of be the point when maybe Tim Pool would have a point about maybe a civil war happens. That's where you get into the territory of maybe a civil war. I'm not saying it would happen. I'm just saying that's what would actually have a chance of that happening as opposed to, oh, there's they're teaching transgender we, people. I mean, we really don't. But, it, it all depends because the, the right now, the Trump legal strategy is delay, delay, delay. And everyone admits it, even a circle admits it, that his goal is to keep delaying these court cases until after the election. After so he the won't, election, yeah, right. so so then he can, you know, dodge it all. But yeah. If some of these, like some of the decisions, if the court, if the court decides, no, actually, we're not going to delay it. We're going to do this now, and then we get more evidence get presented to the public, and we start getting audio out, or all these people who have been flipping on Trump, who have history on his, like as a staff members or people who are close confidants, we could get a bunch of evidence to the public about Trump's intentions that could change the national conversation, that could change how people approach the case. Obviously, if like in the last day in the Rittenhouse trial, we got some new audio of Rittenhouse being like, yeah, I'm gonna go over there, I'm gonna kill everyone because I wanna kill, then obviously that would change right. the circumstances of the trial. For example, yeah. in the court case trial, it was already pretty bad from how uh, the court case trial around the documents, about the classified documents and the mishandling. It already was pretty bad. But when that audio dropped of Donald Trump on audio saying, yeah, these are classified documents. I could have declassified them, but I chose not to. And then he shows them what is assumed to be invasion plans of Iran. 
like stuff like that just <laughs> dropping out of the sky i know that trump is covered in so many scandals some of it kind of yeah. you know just kind of goes off like water off a duck's back but i do think stuff like that could change the national conversation for at least the majority of americans that doesn't mean every american's now going to change their mind on trump some people are dug in they're dug in deep but it would depends on depend on how it was done properly that's why it, if they end up making him ineligible, they got to have every T crossed, every I dotted. It's got to be done by the book, by the book. And if they can't accomplish that, then they shouldn't because then it could backfire. So then that, that leads me to the other question, which is just the consequence of what would happen. L let's just say there's no civil war or anything. Just some people go out in the streets and they're mad or whatever, but it's not like the end of uh, the U.S. If, if that happens. Let's look at the consequence of it uh assuming that the u.s system continues on and nothing really big happens and he just can't run for president now depending on when that is decided uh we might still be in a primary phase and to this point so far at least maybe i'm wrong about this but my understanding is there's only really like a couple people running on the democrat side like i know Cenk uger and marianne williamson are running and then there's joe biden and we all know Joe Biden's going to win. Oh, and, and Dean Phillips, of course. Uh, he, then, oh, that's okay, a close yeah, one. Yeah, okay. And then on the Republican side, my understanding, and maybe I'm wrong here, is that really there's only two people. I think it's only Donald Trump and Nikki Haley that are running right now. Yep. I, I, am I wrong about that? Nope. So she would be the only one who would actually she, have electoral points then. So then my not necessarily. I mean, she would she have would an advantage. She would have an advantage, but as far now, I am a Democrat, so I don't know how the Democrat system works. But how okay. it would work, for example, if Joe Biden had to drop out, is that mm -hmm. uh, like the last day of the convention? If it depends on when he drops out. If he drops out at the convention, he can award his delegates around. Okay. So he could like I nominate Pete Buttigieg to be president of the United States. Joe Biden right. could straight up just. I am the kingmaker. And so Donald Trump, hypothetically, I don't know if it's the same system, maybe he would probably have a lot of sway over okay. who could replace him. Um, I assume it'd become a fight over like the MAGA loyalists who are trying to like be anointed the next yeah, Trump. Like Viva, and there would they... be the other like, like probably old guard and others yeah. who are anti-Trumpers who are like, see, Trump was a terrible idea. He has got all this dirt on him and now even more dirt on him. Let's not continue with this nonsense. Let's do something more moderate, etc. Maybe. So, I, but again, I don't know. It's all hypothetical. Yeah, because I, I remember and I forget who I was But if the question to is going to be, do I like any other person in place of Trump? My answer is yes. Okay, okay. Well, we can get into that. I just, I wanted to kind of go over the technicalities of how that would work. Um, if for whatever reason he's not able to run, uh, what happens? Because I remember listening to somebody, I can't remember who it was. I, I'm not sure if it was Vosh. I, I know I watch Vosh a lot. Um, I, I think he said something like that it would go to basically whoever has the most electoral points at that point. And so far, that would only be Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley is the, the main run. person we would all so, consider. Yeah, Nikki Haley would be the so, main person we would think about. So in that case, where all of a sudden she like because i think right now that's the reason why she's staying in the race because it doesn't really make sense probably it's a big motivator it, yeah because it, it like let's just say there wasn't all this legal stuff regarding donald trump i mm -hmm. think she probably would have dropped out by now i don't see a, a normal path to victory in the in the context of the republican i mean she's down her own state by like 40 points right so mm -hmm. if you lose your own state by 40 points there's no point in staying in the race to see that but if she's if she's banking on waiting for him to be deemed ineligible my guess is her sort of uh and her donors especially there i know a lot of money is poured into this they're probably thinking well it would kind of automatically by the way did you know that biden has raised the most money of any democratic presidential candidate ever ever right yeah well and and i think there's a reason why which is that uh he it's because he's, he's just so of, cute well no i think it's i think well he, he's kind of safe if you're corporate he's not exactly pro-corporate he's definitely Wait, the okay least before we get off can we can but, you were going to a point with the nikki haley stuff can you get to the point okay. i feel like there was a question at the end somewhere yeah well okay the question here is basically let's just assume that for whatever reason if he's deemed ineligible he's not able to give his delegates like i don't know vivek or something it'd probably be vivek if he was going to go for that honestly but uh let's just say he can't he gets no say over it it's just whoever's got the delegates at that point and then nikki haley wins with like a few delegates but they're more than any of the others have because they dropped out mm -hmm. uh, at that point 
we go into a general election then, assuming that this is all decided before the end of the primaries, assuming she's just going to wait it out, um, assuming she has the money to do so, uh, at that point, mm -hmm. we have an election between Joe Biden and Nikki Haley. Yes. Uh, my question for you would be, who do you think you would win and uh, what probability do you think they would win it? I mean, I have oh. it's it's hard to say because Nikki Haley hasn't been given the Biden scrutiny. They haven't done all the digging. They haven't really spent time going after her. So it's hard to know how they would go after her. I think a major issue she'd run into immediately is fundraising, that right. she would uh, basically have to start fundraising almost from scratch in comparison to somebody who's fundraised a lot of money. Then again, yeah. Trump has a huge financial burden of all these legal cases. So that would also be a massive like weight off the shoulders of the of the campaign as well and she won't have to run from court case to court case like donald trump is distracting him from you know staying on the campaign trail um so i i think there are obviously she's a lot less scandal ridden i think that she is a lot less uh likely to be distracted by a bunch of legal nonsense so she's probably going to be on the campaign trail less um i mean campaign trail more i think she probably would have a better chance of beating biden in a general election than donald trump I think that her record is probably cleaner. Um, but I mean, I still would vote for Joe Biden because I disagree with her on a lot of domestic stuff and still a lot of foreign right. policy stuff. I just think that she isn't right. the same threat to American domestic, uh, de uh, de American domestic democracy in the way Trump is. And even See, if she wanted to be, I don't think she has loyalists in her pocket that are willing to take the risks that right. loyalists for Trump have shown they're willing to take. So I, I, to an extent, would disagree. I think, I think in both cases, I think Biden has the advantage going in on the general. I think Biden's going to win in 2024. Uh, but I don't I think it's right. like, oh, yeah, it's 100 percent for Biden or whatever. I think if it's I do think Nikki runs a better campaign than Trump. But I, I think Trump has. I think more people would probably vote for Trump um, over her. Um, it, it, especially on the Republican you, side, I think. More I, but here's the thing: oh. there are so many people, and I'm going around. I was canvassing in Ohio with Progressive Victory. Yeah. There are so many people that I met that are like, "I'm voting to protect democracy. I'm voting to stop Trump. I don't want Trump. I don't want Trump." Once Trump is kicked out of the picture, like, will those people still be motivated to go out and vote? Now, when it comes to midterms and it comes to people down ticket. That seems to be the case. I don't know if you followed New York's third, but I don't know if that's going to be the case for Joe Biden. I mean, not with the polling data that I've seen. I mean, yes. I mean, we've got some great economic indicators. We thought we were going to go into a recession. We did it. Right. We've got like the most, we got like sub like 4% unemployment for, I think the longest period since like the sixties, we've got a uh, more real wage growth. Inflation's coming down. Uh, we've got a lot of really positive economic indicators that while we still have issues with high amounts of public debt, we still have issues with high amounts of school, school debt, medical debt, other issues like that. Right. Um, uh, at the end of the day, this is doing much better than any of the economists predicted. And it's in large part because a Biden step, like, stepped aside and let the Fed do their work. And so I am looking at that and I'm like, that should be a winning campaign. People, when you poll them, you're seeing them answer better and better for how they're personally doing with each poll. But you're not seeing that reflected in Biden's polling data. And that's something no. that that's something that well, concerns me. Well, I think there's some nuance there around the unemployment, for example. You've probably seen the meme of like guy goes up to a cashier and says, hey, look, the economy's doing great. We created five million jobs. And the, the cashier's just like, yeah, and I have three of them. And then she's got her normal work hat and there's the Uber and the McDonald's hat on top of it. It's like, you know, not all the jobs are great. They're created, obviously. And of course, you I know, know yeah, it gets a perfect situation. It's just there's always nuance in these numbers. And uh, there's, of course, a way that it can be spun to try to make Biden look worse. Now, I think I think Biden's done a far better job than uh, than any of the other big Democrats would have done that that would have been in his shoes right now. Uh, I, I think Biden, uh, I think one thing that's in kind of in common with Biden and Trump, even though they don't like each other, is they're both not very ideologically rigid. They're both able to take policies from different directions that they see as working. And I think that that's an advantage. I mean, you talked about how Donald Trump was a political chameleon and that that can be dangerous.
I think that to an extent it can be unpredictable and there there's always some danger and unpredictability but I think rigidity is ultimately more dangerous especially in a time of crisis where if you just lock yourself into ideology ideology like uh uh, Javier Millet is doing in Argentina, for example, you'll, you're on a speed run to run your Look, country into the ground. I, under, I understand so. that. Um, but the thing is, if you look at a lot of like oligarchs in like Eastern Europe, a lot of them are like that political chameleons, where at the end of the day, they like when it comes to ideology, they'll wear whatever is necessary yeah. to serve their own interests. And honestly, Trump reminds me a lot of those Eastern European spoon fed from, you know, I'm not gonna say a royal bloodline, but from an established bloodline, you know, maybe somebody that was connected to the party back in Soviet days, maybe somebody that's right. a established, connected to high society. Trump reminds me a lot of that. And so do I think Donald Trump, who's talking about like invoking the Insurrection Act and going after all of his political opponents with his record, do I think that he'd be willing to take those steps? I do think you'd be willing to take those steps. And so for me, like that political chameleonist well, might mean in a blue moon, Trump might adopt a policy that's good. He did one yeah. thing. There's like a few things I liked that he did. Um, the main one would be, I forget what it was called, but it was something on you know, criminal justice reform that I that I did have to give him at least some praise for, even though now a lot of his right-wing uh, compatriots now give him shit for it, and they said it was a mistake. <laughs> um, yeah. At the end of the day, I think it's all in service of himself. And I think what he's come to the conclusion of is I need to destroy the institutions because the institutions stopped me from doing things that serve myself last time when I tried to grab the horns of democracy. Okay. So I guess that, that kind of raises the other question, which is, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, Maddo and others who have very sort of hysterical predictions about what he would do if he wins again. I guess my question is, he was president for four years. Why didn't he destroy American democracy if that's what he wants to do? I guess would be the question. I mean, because he failed. He was there. Failed. What? That's why. Failed. I mean, Donald Trump is a businessman who is getting into politics for serious for the first time in his life. And he, it was the first time in his life, it was 2015. He was involved to some degree with like lobbying and stuff like that. But he's not a public official. He wasn't a politician. Now he right. is, but he wasn't at the time. He gets elected um, probably to the shock of not only everybody around him, but probably himself <laughs> as well. Uh, yeah. And he's now <laughs> one of the most powerful people on the planet. And yeah. from the get go, you could see he didn't really have an idea of what he was doing. <laughs> firing, rehiring, firing, hiring <laughs> again. I mean, yeah. going from everybody along the ideological spectrum to Steve Bannon, to John Bolton, to like every yeah. everyone, Rex yeah. Tillerson, Mike Pompeo, like just uh, Jeff uh, Sessions. The Scaramucci, the Mooch, do you remember the Mooch. Then there was the Mooch. I mean, mooch. <laughs> he, he went through all these people, and I think a lot of it was him trying to get his footing. And if you talk to a lot of first-time politicians, uh, and definitely in local politics, from my experience, for your first term, a lot of it is substantially just trying to figure out what you're doing, trying to figure out the rules of the game, trying to figure out the ropes. And so I know a lot of people in city council for the first term, they basically do very little because they're spending the whole time trying to get their footing. And for Trump, yeah. we're talking about somebody that has who had, I mean, very little knowledge of right. politics or the international system was burning through staffers like crazy, right? So anybody right. that was giving him a frame of how politics worked, he'd have to like start again when he brings in a new person. Yeah. And I think he fucked it up. And when you talk to Trump supporters, they'll say, oh, you know, he would have done so much better if he just didn't bring in all those establishment rhinos. But this time, mm -hmm. this time he's going to know what he's doing. And maybe he will, maybe he won't. Maybe it'll be the same thing again. Yeah. But I'm not willing to take the risk that this time okay. he'll know what he's doing. So I, I got to clarify then on this because uh, there's kind of this dual narrative about Trump that you'll see from more of the uh, more of the liberal side, like the established comedian sort of side, which is they want to portray him both as like this malevolent, almost like Hitler-like figure who's going to go in there and break down democracy and everything. But then they also portray him as like this bumbling idiot who doesn't know what he's doing. And I guess my question is, if he's a bumbling idiot who doesn't know what he's doing because he's in or whatever... How, Lukashenko, how baby. How, you ever met? No, you just, know, you know Lukashenko. I, you listen to yeah, Lukashenko, Lukashenko talk about you. No, no I, you, you. Did you ever see Lukashenko on the ice rink talking about COVID? <laughs> did you ever see no, that? Lukashenko. Lukashenko let me well, let me tell this. No, no, I got it. Wait, let me finish. Politics. Lukashenko. Right? Yeah, he has a lot. 
okay that's true but let me finish <clears throat> lukashenko was on the ice rink saying that nobody here needs to worry about covid because the <laughs> ice the cold it kills it it just it kills the covid and right, because right. and if you get covid you just drink and then the covid goes away <laughs> what a brilliant yeah. like now so now let me but, but, let me finish let me finish let me have a democracy didn't let me finish here, right <laughs> let me finish it well there was a brief period where actually belarus its first election was a democratic election and then Lukashenko, after becoming the democratically elected leader of Belarus, then took the reins of power, entrenched himself, and yeah. then destroyed Belarusian democracy. This hasn't so only happened in Belarus, you. this has happened in many other countries, countries in West Africa. This has happened right. in, I mean, this it happened in other post-Soviet countries. So, so I guess what I'm just saying is like, so he's a bumbling, with Trump, he's a bumbling idiot, but he's also this serious, dangerous threat who's going to dismantle everything, you know, like a surgeon going in there and he's well, going to take apart all the... the I'm not I, saying, it just, it let me be it, clear, which narrative is it? somebody which narrative can be, is it? somebody can be a threat without being like the smartest, most maniacal threat in the world. Um, for example, I mean, there are uh, Republican politicians who are really, really good at like blocking legislation or knowing how to slow stuff down. Yeah. If you were to sit down and you would have a conversation about the most other aspects of politics, like diplomacy, or you to ask them about economics, if that's not something they're very bright in, and they'll and they don't know what they're talking about. I think Trump can be very good at certain areas. Like I think he's a really good PR guy. Nobody yeah. would argue that Trump isn't a good PR guy or he's a PR yeah. genius. He knows how to get a camera on him. That's a skill that he really has. Do I think he's particularly diplomatic? No, I wouldn't say Trump is a particularly diplomatic individual. So I can think in some areas he right. can be incompetent when it comes to things like world history, when it comes to things like diplomacy, when it comes to things like IR. These are areas that I, I particularly concentrate on, but he right. could be pretty good when it comes to maybe people management. He could be really good yeah. when it comes to things like PR or you know media and integrate and engaging with the press. He can be really good when it comes to public speaking. So he can have skills and be really smart in some areas and be horribly yeah. incompetent in others. Great example, Elon Musk. He's smart in some areas, I assume so. The dude's wealthy, he had to be smart in something, yeah. even yeah. if even if being a scam artist. I don't know what he's smart in. I'm not big in tech. Okay, I tried to do a few pieces on tech, I hate it. But you get that dude start talking about Eastern European politics and he's a <laughs> knuckle dragging moron. And so right. I, okay. my, my <laughs> point is that he could be smart in certain ways to like engage with the press going in the first term, not knowing anything about the rules of power. And then that's why when he tried to do everything at the end of his term, he fucked it up, fell place first, and then had, you no, know, he had to leave. But I'm not saying that he can't learn. I don't think, you don't think he couldn't learn. He could look at, oh, this is what I messed up, or this person wasn't loyal, so I need to replace him this time. And they are thinking about that. And even well, if, even if... Even That's if what a they smart mess it up. person does, though. A smart person learns from their mistakes. But guys like Trevor Noah, they kind of portray him as like a bubbling idiot who can never learn. Well, no, he's in some, no, in some areas, he is an idiot. Like, if you talk to him about the Kurdish people, right? And he's like, well, the Kurds weren't with us at D Day. And I don't know the, he called the president Mr. Kurd. He's called the Mr. President of Kurdistan Mr. Kurd, right? We can go into all these. Those are stupid things <laughs> to say. Or like, right, right. I know the thing, thing about magnets. You pour the water on them and then they stop working. That's the, mag the magnets. Like, the, yeah, like He's these kind are, of a funny guy. These are right? stupid like, things, but that doesn't mean he can't have competence in other areas. I mean, okay. again, there's a lot of dictators who are really wacky. Idi Amin was a vicious, vicious, vicious dictator, but he had to have some acumen to climb up the ranks and be uh, awarded by the British like he was before he became dictator of Uganda. Yeah, okay, I, I see where you're going there. I guess, I before I forget, I want to get into the other uh, conversation, which was you said that you thought that uh, the other candidates uh, wouldn't be as big of a threat to the U.S. as Donald Trump. Like, do you, yeah. I guess I just want some clarification on that, because I know when I watched the debate, for example, uh, Nikki Haley said, and we could have a conversation about the interpretation of this, but I know how I interpreted it, uh, especially as somebody who used to support her. She said that she would meet China with, quote, with force if they went and blockaded or invaded Taiwan. Uh -huh. And to me, I think a nuclear war, even even one that America wins with China, is more dangerous because even if they, even if you win, 
all China has to do in that skirmish is just lob off a few uh, ICBMs at the agriculture in the Midwest and do some ground bursts. And now you can't grow uh, food in America for 70 years, right? So uh, even if you win, that'd be a great they strategy just, oh, if you well, they know, can just solve we couldn't the Midwest, shoot back at them. Right? Yeah, um, well, no, what I'm saying is uh, essentially here is that it's, I, I it's think posturing. It's a, Let's be clear. It's posturing. The, she's posturing a position that the United States uh, believes Taiwan is important for a national security, whether it be freedom of navigation operations, whether it be the chip market, whether it be the continuation of American credibility in the region and the Taiwan's Relations Act and us upholding what has been the law of the land since 1979, the continuation of the status quo. Um, I don't, I understand that the rhetoric is getting more aggressive, but when it comes to the actual like force deployed in the region, I, I don't think that that is particularly like frightening me too much, that statement, no. I think it's posturing. I think it's it's intended to make the Chinese think again when it comes to in invading Taiwan. She could say that and then literally do nothing when the Chinese attack Taiwan, just sure. so just so that threat of it could dissuade an invasion. So even if we would never intervene, the Chinese thinking that we could, yeah. could dissuade a war and be prevented a war that would have occurred otherwise yeah. if the threat was not made. That's the bet See? I think she's making. Let me be clear, you might disagree with that bet, I don't even think Trump makes any of this calculus when he thinks of this shit. I okay. think I, I don't think Trump thinks about it. I think Trump flip flops at a moment on any of these decisions, just like he did with northeastern Syria. And when it comes to like doing something irrational that could start a nuclear catastrophe, I think Trump's statements about like, oh, fuck NATO, we'll abandon NATO, Russia, do whatever you want. Even if it's just meant to get a few more dimes out of Europe, statements like that create uncertainty about a defense commitment. Statements like that create uh, make the Russians wonder how committed are we really? to Estonia. So, How committed are we really to Latvia? That's something that I believe is going to create a, a security crisis or more likely to create a security crisis.